Hi, everybody. I'm Josh Byerly here in Mission Control Houston. I am joined by Amelia Rye. She is part of the International Space Station Program Science Team. So she's going to be here probably answering most of your questions. I'll be here for the basic ones. But <laughs> So we're ready to take your questions whenever you are ready over there. All right. So, um, hi, um, my name's Amy Cordero, and um, so Amelia, your bio mentions various outreach programs you've done. I'm familiar with some of them. Um, I'm from Austin, Texas. Um, my question is, what got you interested in education outreach, and what is your favorite part about it? Education outreach to me is a form of mentorship, and it allows me to um, pay forward what I've experienced in my career. I've had the benefit of many mentors um, as I've changed roles um, throughout my career, and uh, this to me is an important job as far as recruiting future talent. So uh, what I enjoy most is the opportunity to potentially affect um, you know, the future of one of the students that uh, I could mentor. That's a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Miner, and my question is, if our ability to fully understand space is limited by light and other factors in outer space, why do you believe it's important to begin space research, and how can it benefit our society? Space research is so important in so many ways. You know, researchers um, are have curiosity, and curiosity is what drives what we do. Um, the the deeper the level of curiosity, the more that we can uncover. Um, a parallel would be like your education. You know, you start out with a bachelor's degree, you maintain that level of curiosity, you consider maybe pursuing the the masters, maybe the PhD, and with each advanced degree, you're learning more. So research is similar. The parallel would be that with continued research, you just uncover more so um, it drives it drives what we learn that we bring back benefits to the earth for for example you know um, you can you can have an h a hypothesis in the lab that uh, your outcomes are completely different from what you expected but um, what you uncover is equally valuable and uh, it can be translated sometimes into completely non-related fields um, if you take um, the the uh, robotics research that was done in uh, creating the Canadian arm you can translate that uh, um, into the medical industry, and there have been individuals diagnosed with tumors that were inoperable. But um, if you have, um, you know, uh, computer-based uh, operations that are guided, um, you know, you have more precision capability than if a human hand was performing that same surgery. So these individuals that have the benefit of uh, this technology have a second chance at life. So that's one of the benefits. Another um, in a completely different uh, field would be, you know, the purview from which um, we have a view of Earth from station. If you were to take photographs, which we do, we take uh, imagery from station and we have the opportunity to um, conduct Earth observations. Um, things, for example, like, uh, right, um, you can see beautiful things that like the aurora or you could see things that can benefit us in terms of disaster preparedness. Um, volcanic eruptions, we don't see them from that purview, but you can. Um, global change, um, the, the melting of glaciers, that's another opportunity to, um, to see um, how the surface of the Earth changes over time. By the way, in case you guys saw that picture that just popped up on the screen that Seth put up there, that is actually uh, the cities of Houston. Uh, Dallas, Austin is in there, uh, San Antonio is in there, and uh, Waco, Temple, Colleen, that sort of area. So that's on the internet in case you saw that. That's, uh, I know some of you are from Austin, some other places. That's, uh, mm -hmm. that's your hometown down there. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Abigail. I'm from Western North Carolina, and I just want to know why you think it's important to be constantly researching topics in science, especially on the ISS. And this ties into the question that was just asked. It's about continuing um, your research so that you can go to that deeper level of understanding. Um, you know, curiosity doesn't have like a terminal point. I mean, you're as curious as you desire to be. So with continued curiosity, there's an opportunity to learn more. And uh, the more we know, the, the more we can, you know, live the best possible lives here on Earth. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Lauren Sherwood, and my question was, what role do international relations play in your daily work? 
That's a really good question. So since I joined the, joined the program science office, I have this great opportunity on a monthly basis to take part in um, monthly telecons with our international partners. And if you think about it, it's so fascinating that you know we are connected um, from all over the world: Japan, Canada, Russia. You know, we we are in a telecon. It's morning in in one place, it's afternoon in another, and it's evening somewhere else. But we all take that time out of our you know non business hours to, um, to you know, conduct our shared vision on, on uh, you know, products that we are producing in the program science office as a team so that we can, you know, bring all um, of what we learn to the public. Well, and, and people, to add to that, you know, these different control rooms, like here in Mission Control, they talk with people in Japan and Russia and Canada and Europe and I mean, all over the place mm -hmm. every single day. And even the people in our office, the public affairs officers, there's a handful of us that get to travel four times a year over to Russia and Kazakhstan uh, for the Soyuz launch and landings. That's where we launch and land our astronauts now that we don't have a space shuttle. Um, so we work with those guys very closely over there. And something that, you know, you grow up and you don't really ever picture yourself uh, doing something like that, but whenever you work for something like NASA, it's uh, so true. It becomes not normal, but <laughs> we take it for granted. So it, uh, we do. You know, it's 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 a fun job. And I'm still at that point where I'm still excited about <laughs> it. I haven't taken it for granted quite yet, and I hope I don't. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name's Belinda Grunfeld. I'm from New York. I was wondering how working with the ISS and NASA has changed your perspective on daily life. Working with NASA and the International Space Station is um, so powerful, really. Um, you know, if you have a conversation with a neighbor, with a family member, you can still see how NASA has that brand that just resonates yeah. with people, you know, um, brings them back to memories of Apollo, uh, shuttle memories, and, you know, what the future has in store for us. So the, the brand identity that the NASA meatball, so to speak, holds is uh, it's powerful. And I feel so fortunate to be a part of that. And also, I think, uh, uh, you know, at least I, I grew up in Texas, and, uh, you know, if, if you met somebody when I was growing up that's from, you know, the upper northeast coast or something like that, you know, they were considered so far away. And whenever you work here, you work with people all over the world, and it's just normal. You know, it, it, uh, you realize this is a very small planet we live on, and everybody is, is yeah. much, I think, more closely aligned than, than we are different. And, and that's one thing, you know, you can talk to people in Japan, like I talked about, and uh, Russia and places like that, and it's just kind of... It's just normal. It so. just feels like they're sitting right yeah, next to you. Yeah, it feels like they're right next to you. So. True. Thank you. Hello there. Um, I'm Elena Renzi from Peachtree City, Georgia, and I would like to know, how do you remain calm and collected during a stressful moment in mission control? <laughs> So the flight controllers are highly trained. Um, you know, to allow the distress to take you over is really a decision. Um, yeah. You know, it has to be a conscious decision to stay calm, and it requires practice. And, you know, they, they conduct, um, you know, uh, um, simulations in their practice where they prepare for the anomalies, they prepare for those unexpected events. So when they do happen, if they happen, you know, it's it's not the first time that they've seen this. And so it affords them the opportunity to um, be somewhat prepared. Um, you know, to stay focused, it allows you to think more clearly. So it's in your best interest to develop that skill as best you can. Um, and, you know, it allows you to find that resolution that much more quickly. So. It's a decision. And I think that's what shocks people the most, just when, you know, they've seen the movies and, yeah. and they see, you know, a pretty a crazy environment here inside Mission Control. And the first time that I came here years ago, that was the thing that shocked me the most is that it's not like that at all. It is so calm <laughs> right. and so professional and so quiet. There's no, you know, dramatic music playing or anything like that at all. People are just very focused on their jobs and, and, you know, we could have a major issue happening. And if you walked in here and you stood in the room, you probably wouldn't even know Very it true. unless you were listening to the headset but there's you're looking at brian smith that's the flight director sitting there on the far right hand side uh and the capcom uh is there on the left but those guys are pretty much in charge of this team here and it's, it's just incredibly focused and incredibly um uh, they just they just work their jobs you know it's, it's just it's it's very um solid All right, thank you yeah Hi, I'm Nina Singh from Kansas City, Kansas, and I was wondering, what do you think is the next step in space research in the ISS and in the future in general? 
from my perspective and in the work that I do in the program science office, our focus right now is to bring in new researchers. Um, we want to expand the use of our platform. This is a national lab that is open and available for use. So I'm working on um, a 15 book set of, um, it's, a dis it's a series of books by discipline that we hope will connect the experts in those disciplines to uh, the potential use of the platform. Mm -hmm. You know, um, folks don't realize that they may be able to translate their ground-based research yeah. onto the ISS. So that is the hope for these books, that we're going to get it into the hands of the right researchers and that it's going to bring in new users. And that it's not hard. I mean, that's, that's really I think one of the biggest things is that, you know, people think, oh my gosh, how can I even... You know, if I'm a scientist, how can I even get my research up aboard the space station? Here's this huge laboratory, and it really, it's not. That's right. I mean, it's it's more than just filling out a form, but it's you know, it's it's not. It's it's we're trying to make it easier for scientists to actually have access to it. So. Right. All right. Thank you. That's a cool T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Abigail Lindsay, and I'm from Mobile, Alabama. And I was wondering, as a successful woman in STEM, what discouragement have you had to overcome, and what encouragement and advice would you give to girls interested in STEM? So I'll start with the encouragement. I think that uh, one of the best things that you can do is learn how to work well in a team environment, because that is so much what we do. Um, in addition, have... Um, an understanding of the value that diversity brings to a team environment because you know you don't want to be on a team with clones of yourself because really you're all going to derive the same answer or the same approach to an issue but when you have diversity you have the opportunity to see things from multiple perspectives and come up with the most innovative solution to the, the issue and finally um, be open-minded about those different approaches so that um, your team members feel comfortable working with you um, so disadvantages, you know, don't don't look at any disappointments as uh, a failure. Just move through them mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, find that silver lining because I believe there always is one. There's an opportunity to learn. Um, so a disadvantage is in the negative. It's just an opportunity to grow. Mm -hmm. So just keep that momentum through that disadvantage and find that light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Megan Cooney, and I would like to know what personality traits and characteristics do you think are most important to be a successful woman in a STEM career? I think it starts with knowing yourself, and it requires some introspection as you grow and, and learn more about yourself, but when you know what motivates you, you're going to do your best, and you're going to want to come to work every day, just like we do, and you're going to you're going to excel because uh, being at work isn't a job, it's a career, and uh, you feel pride in, in, in the work that you're conducting. Yeah, we just talked to Peggy Whitson and Pam Melroy, two uh, pretty famous astronauts, and the two women commanders. One uh, was SCS-120 commander, one was the Expedition 16 commander. And uh, I kind of asked them the same sort of question, you know, for people who are going into science, how do they figure out what they want? And they both sort of said the same thing, which is you got to follow your passion. And that's to Amelia's answer, you got to know yourself. you really got to go find something that you really love to do because uh, there's a shot of Peggy on the left, I mean, on the right, and uh, Pam on the left. But you got to go find what your passion is and, and chase after it, and that'll lead to success. That's probably the most important thing I think everybody in this room would, would, would tell you. Agreed. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Nora Chikuti, and I was wondering how important is outreach in drawing awareness to NASA and creating an interest in STEM fields? <laughs> That's a really important question. It is so important. In parallel to the really cool and interesting stuff we're doing, we need to recruit our future talent. Yeah. So that's the job that we need to do to secure those um, students that are focusing on STEM who are going to be our future astronauts, our future business leaders, our future scientists. You know, we need to make sure we have that pool of candidates that we can draw from. So it's extremely important. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Hi, I'm Nikki Theresia from Saratoga, California, and I was wondering, having seen science and research both in their incipients at ISEF and at their apex at the ISS, have you seen any progression and growth? And if so, uh, what would you advise those interested in research and science to focus on and pursue? 
So this goes back to following, you know, what motivates you. Um, you know, if you're, if you try and, um, follow a career path that someone that you admire um, has followed, then you're really not doing anything unique. Um, you can certainly look to them as role models, but you know what's going to bring you to your highest level of success, or to use your words, the apex of, of your um, capabilities is to, to follow what has what gives that fire to your soul, you know, and, and really just pursue what motivates you and drives you. So it's it's less about choosing a focus area and more about just allowing yourself to lead you you're going to be leading yourself to your own interests good question thank you hi my name is katie morris and i'm from alabama and my question is did you have a mentor on your road to success and if so what did they teach you that is a really good question, and it's an important one, too. I have had multiple mentors through my career, um, and I will continue to. Uh, mentorship isn't always formal. Sometimes it can be informal. It's someone you're sitting next to. Um, and, you know, you have to seize that opportunity. And, um, you know, I also believe that part of growing in your career is to be both a mentor and a protege throughout your career. You know, on the one hand, you're you're sharing your skills and paying it forward, so to speak, and on the other hand, you're still leaving yourself open to learning when you're a protege. So um, I think that it benefits us all to um, to be both a mentor and protege throughout our entire careers. And I think you, it's, it's good if you have several different mentors. You need to kind of, mm -hmm. you know, sort of steal from the best uh, yeah. through several different people. You don't want to model yourself after just one person. You kind of want to pull from the best of, of several different ones and kind of kind of create your own you know self or whatever it is but uh you know i think that that's always served people best is to sort that's of that's true have a wide variety of people that you sort of model yourself after and to add to that josh i think it's so important to not be shy i yeah. have approached um some of the best mentorship that i've received has been through me just approaching someone and saying yeah. you know do you have some time to sit down with me yeah, and talk to me brain. yeah and it, it creates some um, you know um professional contacts that you might be able to uh connect with in the future yeah Okay, thank you. I'm Ivy Chang from Arizona, and my question is, um, what part of research that has been conducted on the ISS did you find unexpected, yet at the same time very intriguing? I think the student research is always mm -hmm. fun. Um, you may recall, Josh, there was a school in San Diego where um, I believe it was a Hebrew uh, academy, yeah. and um, they wanted to um, they wanted to test um, some principles in electrostatics. So they had the astronauts uh, charge a um, like a plastic uh, tube, yeah. and um, introduce a, a water droplet to that tube and and what they assumed would happen i believe was that uh, the water droplet would just free form through microgravity but in reality what happened was there was an attraction um um, with the opposite charges, and then that water droplet began to orbit the tubing, and it was not only a surprise to the students, but to the astronauts as well. So um, that was one of the exciting um, experiments that was conducted. So the students they always bring a, a level of fun to what we do. Well, we had, you guys probably have seen this before. We had spiders on board. We've mm -hmm. had spiders actually up there several times, but uh, we were watching. I think it was back during a shuttle mission. We had this spider that, that wove this web up in space, and it was just crazy. It wasn't symmetrical at all, and then it tore it down and then built another one that was perfectly symmetrical. And it's like if a spider, which has a brain, you know, right. significantly smaller than anybody, anything else, can figure out how to adapt to no gravity, you know, what, what can we do uh, ultimately, which is fascinating. That's right. It was about adaptation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Brian Lewis, and I'm from Orange, California. And my question is, having designed your books to bring in new researchers, what would you look for in a new researcher, like qualities or experiences? So the researchers that we would likely be, attra uh, be attracting is... Um, 
folks that probably have their doctorates in their disciplines and uh, already have existing ground-based research that they could potentially translate mm -hmm. to the platform and um, take advantage of the microgravity environment, um, which would afford them um, you know, findings that they, they wouldn't see in a lab on Earth. So that's the population of researchers that we're looking for. Yeah. All right, thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah Crawford from New York, and my question is, do you feel like being a woman has helped you in your field or hindered, and why? I don't feel like it has helped or hindered me to be a woman. I don't think that... Um, it is in my best interest to focus on things I can't control, like my gender. Um, I think it's more valuable to use that energy and that effort towards focusing on your um, capabilities and, you know, uh, focusing on being the best candidate for the jobs that you want to pursue. So um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't focus on on gender or anything that you can't control. Definitely put the focus where it's going to benefit you the most and have the the greatest dividends um, for your uh, career development. Yeah, it's a good question. So we got about five minutes left. Are there any other questions? You can step on up and not be nervous. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Morgan Kemmerlin. I'm from Georgia. And I was just wondering, because you were um, asking about having more researchers come in, are there any specific fields of research that you would like to have more research That's a good question. For? That's a very good question. We have uh, multiple disciplines that, uh, you know, we um, are creating the books in support of. Um, gosh, um, you know, um, I, I am working right now on uh, the rodent science book. Um, we are in the process of writing the plant book, uh, technology demonstration. Uh, the list goes on, and they're all going to be available online, which is a nice research uh, resource for all. Um, you know, there's no limit. Uh, we don't want to limit what we can do on station, um, but uh, that that's the focus right now. Those are the books that I'm currently working on. So we've got time for about one more. Good question. Um, hi, I'm Ellis. I'm from Colorado, and I was wondering what your favorite research experiment currently on the ISS is. Ooh, that's a good one. I haven't thought about that. Um, I can tell you mine. I think we've talked about it before. Mine's EarthCam, uh, which is the one that's the Sally Ride EarthCam. She started this back on the shuttle, uh, and then put it on board the space station. And it's really a chance for you guys. And we're about to have one coming up. I think July 9th. There's another one. Uh, that's going to be run to where, y you know, you get to pick what this camera points down at on Earth and, and, and takes photos of. And, and some of the students' uh, photos have just been incredibly remarkable. But we've had something like 50,000 students participate in this, which is just mm -hmm. uh, awesome. So that, that's, that's mine. And that's, that's probably up there. I'm going to have to think about that a little bit more. I think there's uh, more than one that I like, so I haven't picked a favorite. Yeah, it's, it's hard to ask the science guys what their favorite experiment is because they're kind of over all of them. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they can't really pick a favorite child. But... Uh, but there's a lot, and if you guys ever want to read about them or, or take a look at some of the stuff Amelia works on, you know, you can always go to the NASA website, which is nasa.gov slash station. Uh, that's the uh, space station homepage. But if you look on the left-hand side uh, of the page, whenever you go there, there's a, there's a button that says Research and Technology. And if you click mm -hmm. on that, um, you, it'll open up, and you can pick it by expedition. So we're on Expedition 36 now. Uh, you can pick it by disciplines. You can take a look at all the different biology experiments, right. all the different physics experiments, I mean, some things that some of us don't even understand down here on the ground, but um, you can see the hundreds of experiments that this crew actually works on, and, and, and also the Earth benefits in terms of, you know, not only what does this mean to, to spaceflight, but also what does it mean right here on Earth, because sometimes there's impacts here on Earth that we don't really even uh, anticipate uh, that actually improve life here on Earth and, and, and our lives here. So all good questions. We want to thank you guys for uh, joining us here on NASA Television and talking with Amelia. Amelia, thank you very much for, oh. for taking time out of your My day. My pleasure. But, uh, we hope you guys enjoyed it, and uh, we hope you enjoy uh, your time down here as, as part of the WISH uh, group. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.